Hello and welcome everyone. Welcome to the opening night film of our fourth edition of Frames Representation Film Festival. Uh, my name is Nico Marzano, I'm the festival founder and curator. And it's my pleasure to, to see you all here tonight. Uh, I just want to offer a few words about the program in general and then the, the film, tonight film, uh, what you're going to do when the world is on fire by Roberto Minervini. Um, I can already see many familiar faces, but uh, for those who don't know, Frames is a festival that every year try to uh, connect, even if loosely, the films as part of the program through a team. A team, a team that works for, for me to, to select the, 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 the films, but also for, for you uh, as a point of reference to, uh, to see the, the films as a whole, uh, body of work as a whole. This year is deframing. Why, why deframing? Deframing because the idea was to a bit to go back uh, to the, um, and investigate the research on the principles that inspired Frames Representation in the first place as project in, back in 2015, that is that desire of nurture a space for um, for that kind of cinema that goes against any rigid categorization, uh, that kind of cinema that uh, looks at uh, a political commitment uh, in connection with uh, the aesthetics of the film and how we look at representation, how the filmmakers look at the essence of representing the others ourselves. The uh, framing also as an act of uh, resistance uh, to present films that um, uh, offer a, a certain fluidity, that embrace reality. In fact, I like to think that Frames Representation is the festival of the cinema of the real. A cinema that embraces reality as an act of constant transformation, uh, as something that uh, can bring us close to uh, integration, to expression, um, and to a community, and this is what we will try to do. Over the next nine days, we want to form a community with all of you. We hope to see you to as many events as possible. Um, and we want to, to say thank you to all the filmmakers that also for this year accepted our invitation. The idea is that you know we are here to watch the films of our peers, to share uh, and to talk about it. And and for me, it's exciting to see that the variety of the program, like, you know, different trajectories, different approaches to, to cinematic languages. Uh, we have established masters this year for uh, our frames like uh, Roberto Minervini, Carlos Regadas, Juan Bing, but alongside also people who are presenting their first feature, like Adele Tulli, uh, like Lyubomor Stefanov and Tamara Kotesca. Um, we welcome back Gilad Baram, uh, Gaston Solniki. Uh, and, uh, and many more. Um, we also present a live cinema experiment next Friday, uh, a very personal project by Joe Bean and Maya Oak. Um, and uh, there will be a symposium that will conclude as per tradition frames representation. We will reflect on those nine days uh, on the Saturday because the festival runs until Saturday 20th of April. Uh, I just want to say, uh, before introducing the film, I want to say thank you to Chase, who is our academic partner. Uh, to MUBI, with whom we are sharing the opening night and the closing night, to the Italian Cultural Institute that was instrumental uh, to help us in creating these two events today, uh, the screening that you are going to see at the roundtable discussion that took place just uh, earlier this evening. Um, as I said, the deframing was a way to go back and investigate our roots, what we are trying to do with this festival, with this project, and it's not a coincidence that really we are opening the festival with a filmmaker that opened the very first edition of Frames Representation, who is Roberto Minervini. Uh, Roberto is a filmmaker of one kind, because he puts all his art in his projects in the sense that uh, to the point of creating, co-creating with, uh, with the, the subjects that he uh, decides to uh, interact with. Uh, it's a film about struggles, the struggles of the South, of US, um, and there are different uh, moving stories going through, as you will uh, be able to see uh, very soon. Please join me in welcoming Roberto Minervini, Judy Hill, one of the producers of the film, and Nat Turner, one of the members of New Black Panthers. Thank you for coming to the screening. Uh, it's an honor to be here. It's a, it's a very happy moment for me to be back here. Um, as usual, I won't say 
much about the film, but as usual, I'll probably say too much about it. So this is a, a version of the film that, um, that we edited until my dad passed away last year. So then we, we stopped working on it for three months. And, and that is why this actually director's cut, which is when I was in a good place with my heart, uh, is shorter than the version then that premiered in Venice. And I care about this. I wanted to just uh, let you know about this anecdote. But apart from that, the most important thing that I could share at this moment before the screening is that <clears throat> this is also my uh, one of the milestones of my experience in America in these 18 years that I've lived in America, I've become American, and I lived in the American South, I live in Texas, and especially in this case, I work with black America. And this is my attempt and not patronizing a culture, people, uh, black Americans, black culture, black people in general. And I did it because, and that is, it's no coincidence that, that this is the project where I listen the most. And this is the project where there's more dialogue because people really needed to speak. So uh, we'll be back for Q&A. Of course, I won't do it alone. I would do it with, uh, with Judy Hill, she's one of the main the protagonist of the film and Nat Turner of the new Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. Um, they bring tremendous presence, also invaluable uh, insight on their life. That is not my life. That much I learned. So thank you for being here and uh, we'll see you in a less than two hours actually. So not that much. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. Thank you all for coming out. I'm not going to say I wish you enjoyed the movie. I only wish you understand it. Thank you. I'm just going to say this. Um, the, the, the film is basically what we consider uh, trying to take the, the lid off of what's going on in America. You know, it, it you know parades around like it's the has a monopoly on what democracy is. So we just want to do that so y'all can actually see reality as opposed to fiction, you know, that they pump out through the corporate control media. All right, y'all enjoy. Uh, Robert, I would like to start with you. I remember very clearly that uh, it was a few years ago, um, you were telling me that you were uh, sure that uh, someone like Trump was going to be elected as president. I remember I was looking at you almost in this disbelief because at that point he was only one of the many candidates that looked like a bit hard. But clearly you had the feeling, you had like, you know, uh, you were living there, so um, something was telling you that that was going to happen. Was this also one of the reasons you started to, to research on this project? And now then the election of Trump changed, like, you know, the course of your project as you went along. I guess the two things are in a way related in the sense that, um, uh, so in my, with my pre especially with my, my uh, previous film uh, where I work with, uh, I really observed that with the, the resurgence of the right wing extremisms and, 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 and the spread, spreading of hate. Uh, and, 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 and so, uh, yes, and just to make this long story, you know, I don't want to make it a long story, but yes, I was convinced by, by seeing what was going on that Trump will ultimately, you know, succeed uh, with this message that was the message that was the reach touched the heart or lack of thereof of people uh, closely. Um, but there's something else that made me, uh, uh, that made me decide to make um, th this project is that I remember very well, um, it was 2016, so before the election of Trump, it was uh, July the 5th when Alto Sterling was murdered in Baton Rouge. And uh, and I had no idea that I was gonna make a film like this. I was just, no, you know, that was happening, and that was in the mainstream news. That's all, I, that's all I knew at that time. And that Philando Castile was killed, if I remember well, it was two days after. But then, maybe 10 days after or so, a uh, black man killed a policeman in Dallas. And I remember very vividly that, that the man got arrested and said, the young man, and said, you know, there was time to, to, to step up and strike back. And I vividly remember 
uh, the political, the electoral campaign, presidential campaign had started, but I do remember these candidates talking about something that could be translated into the coming back of a sentiment that permeated white society, which was the fear of black people. And I remember that's the moment when I thought, this is a very powerful political tool. And that's when I thought, this is it. You know, the fear of black people is coming back and, 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 and uh, Trump was voicing all that. Uh, Trump voiced even more than immigration. Trump talked about the, the danger of it. He started talking again about the, the, the downtowns, downtowns, the danger downtowns, downtown. But I love black people. Downtown, we got a clean downtown. What is clean in downtown? Who inhabits Chicago uh, or south of Chicago? See, he was talking about that, not the, yes, downtowns and uh, the ur urban centers, the main urban centers of America. He was talking about that. And I do remember, and, and I thought, okay, I gotta get my ass down there and take a look. So that's what I did. And, uh, and, and that's how I started meeting the people that are in the film. But yes, so in a way, Trump, there's, it's not that the presidency informed uh, this film, it's what was going on and the feeling that something was happening again. And I'm talking from a point of view of a white person because some people that not that what I learned is that people knew that, <laughs> they known that all along, but for us, they watch mainstream media to see that the field of black people emerging again and being uh, utilized as a, as, a, as a political tool. And that was something disturbing. So that was the beginning of this project, really. Before moving uh, also on to Judy and, and uh, Nat, I also would like to ask you another thing in relation to your filmmaking practice. Uh, basically, as maker, you work very closely with, with your community, with the subjects of your film. And it's clear to me that your devotion, your thoughtful way of like, you know, uh, engaging with them, strong sense of responsibility. How does this sense of responsibility inform your filmmaking? How you relate to that? I, I guess we could call it sense of responsibility, but what, how is that? The sense of responsibility is, is informed by an awareness that comes from my roots as a European and we're Italian growing up in Italy of uh, somewhat being on the wrong side of history and wanted to, but not really knowing how and why, but it became something that, that from a, emo, from, a, from a feeling standpoint, emotional standpoint, it's understanding that. So the sense of responsibility is moved by perhaps a sense of guilt. And, uh, and uh, since I'm a father to little children, it's that sense of integrity. Maybe my parents gave me that sense of integrity or having to, you know, be able to look at myself in the mirror at night and, and knowing that I, the legacy is, the inheritance of my children is that is, is belief, believing in something, you know, believing that generation after generation you can plant seeds for, you know, something better. So in that sense, we could call this sense of responsibility, I'm not sure, but yes, that is something that pushes me and motivates me to try to, you know, day after day to do something that makes more and more sense, not just to me. So that is, but to, to people around me. Now, people around me, uh, that is what changed because uh, from me and having a sense of responsibility for my children, and my wife, and my parents, then, you know, the circle started getting bigger and bigger. And at this point, I, I, it expanded to the point that across the line, that not many people, at least that I know of, cross, which is, you know, step into what we could call Black America and take a look and, and, and talk to people and, and try somewhat to be at service uh, because of the fact that I'm a media person. And, um, so yeah, in that sense, definitely, there is a sense of responsibility. Um, but comes from definitely a sense of you know, an, an ease and, and guilt. Judy, and this will be also a question for you, Nat. I would like to, I mean, first of all, of course, you know, if you can introduce us how, how you uh, meet Roberto. But before going there, I would like to understand if Roberto is a foreigner, an outsider, no, for North American society. And if that position of outsider 
contributed to, to trust him uh, way more uh, easily because it's clear throughout the film, throughout the three sections of the film, that an important level of trust was built amongst you, amongst your fellow comrades, Nad and Rolando and Titus. And I would like to hear from you, Judy. My thing is, as far as building trust, as we were talking about earlier today, is not building. You don't build. There's no way in the world I can tell you, hey, come see me tomorrow. I'm going to start trying to trust you. It don't happen like that. It has to be from here, not here. The mind play all kind of tricks on you. Sometimes the mind take you places you don't even want to be. And with that being said, Roberto came to my bar, the Oopoopadoo bar. He was hanging out there. He came to do a movie on a guy called Lab Belly. But hanging out at the bar laughing and talking. I invite everybody to the bar. I had people from all over the world coming to my bar. All color, race, creed, everybody would be at the Upupadu bar. But when I met Roberto Menavini, not knowing what he came for, whatever, he was trying to do something. After a while, we found out he had a camera. We did. And, and, and me being open and, you know, you if you were sitting in my bar, you can see some things I'll go through because I think out loud. I don't hold nothing in. I'll be like, God damn it. I got to do this and I got to ever to say, you know what? Miss Judy, do you mind if, you know, we um kind of get, you know, do the camera thing with you, however you put it. And I'm like, you know what? Let's see. Although we were getting real cool by then, we, we built this relationship. We became almost family. But at the end of the journey, we became real trunk tight. Not trunk, yeah. trunk tight. So, um, and then, uh, you know, once I found out, it, you know, we was cool, we was good. I felt him like a brother. He felt me like a little sister or whoever the oldest. Nobody's asking, but. <laughs> yeah, so, and I, I say, you know what? I say, look, Roberto, come over. I got some young people in here. I want you to cut the cameras on us. We need to be heard. I'm 52 years old. We never been heard nowhere. My mom, 89, is Dorothy Hill. She never had, she couldn't tell her story, especially during her time. Nobody wasn't trying to hear nothing no black people had to say, because that means you're stepping on white people's feet. Because if my mama wasn't so shy and told her story, I probably wouldn't be the main actress. She probably would be. But I knew what she taught us, you feel me? I understand everything my mama ever said. I was one of those kids. She had eight girls and four boys. I was one of those kids that stood in the house and babysat all those kids. I was there. That's how I wound up getting caught up in a situation I was in, in the house. My mama had nothing to do with me being molested. Nothing at all. She wasn't aware. She had to still work. You know, I put nobody at fault. I, I don't know what to feel with that. You know, I don't know. But I know I was misused. I know I was. At one point, I thought everybody in the house knew. I thought it was a conspiracy. But to make a long story short, Roberto, we wound up being cool. I would call him, Roberto, look, come over here. Roberto, come by my mama. This going on. Do you mind? Come? And he was there. Never opened his mouth. We didn't have, we didn't rehearse nothing. We didn't write nothing. Because half of the people in here would never, in, the, in our state of mind, we would never be able to read a script. Ever. Everything you see is raw and uncut. Uh, um, you are on. Well, uh, my comrade called me up and said, hey, this guy this people from Italy, they want to shoot a documentary. I was like, Italy? He's like, yeah. So what the hell are they doing here? So how the hell they end up in New Orleans from Italy? What's going on? So and she was calling me, yeah, I don't know about that shit, man. I don't know. You know, I've done one document, I've done another one. You know, I just 
I wouldn't. Nah, y'all go ahead. She was like, come on, let me just go over there and just meet with them. I said, how you know they ain't the damn police? You know, if, you know, they do that shit all over the world. You know, Pose as a contractor, you know, he go over there, he a carpenter and all this kind of stuff. You know, like, man, y'all go ahead. Come on now. She just kept going and keep going. It's all right, man. Come on. So sat up in there and was like, I had my hoodie on. Like, I don't know these people here. So when it was going on on about this film, stuff like, so what's the, like, who y'all, who are y'all? Like, what's the purpose? Like, well, you know, it's, it's all right. So check this out. Okay, so you mean to you gonna shoot a document, you're gonna film this stuff like that. I was like, what's the catch? Like, what's the what's the long term goal of this documentary? Like, what we what we gonna get out of this shit, man? I done did this shit before. I ain't doing this stuff no more. I done seen people come to the walls and shoot a document, all this kind of stuff, get the going on, rhetoric. I was like, man, I ain't doing that no more. So she just kept going on and on and on. Even when we left, I was like, I ain't doing that. Come on, come on. And, you know, she just keeps going and going and going. So I just kind of caved in and said, all right, girl, you better pat yourself on the back. <laughs> I ain't doing no more of this shit. I said, we don't know where they are. You know, they ain't the police from Italy. It might be Interpol. I, you, know, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> hey, damn. You know, I'm like, all right, man. So you tripping. You All right. Okay. Well, okay. I guess it would just be our little suicide. You know, so that's how. That's, and so I'm that's sitting up in there like, hey, my shades on. <laughs> he still don't know what my eyes look like today. <laughs> He ain't never seen me without my glasses, man. So I'm like, well, damn. <laughs> he, he got a copy of the passport because I was forced to do that shit <laughs> to come here. <laughs> but that was it. So I'm like, man. So I went on and I did, you know, did my little, I did a little ritual. And I said, I'm going to ask the ancestors about this. And he was like, go for it. We got you. So, I, so come on, man. Let's, let's go ahead. So I still was like, Reluctance after the first time when he came on me with that camera. I was like, this shit hot. I was like, man, I know this man, they trying to give me cancer. You know, because I heard about that that microwave frequency beam stuff, you know. You know what I'm saying? So I'm like, the camera, the lens, the laptop, you know, I was hip to that kind of stuff, man. But it, the camera was hot, like, and it, I don't know if y'all can notice, I'm like trying to talk and, and you know, like, right him, like, shit. Oh, wait, I forgot my train of thought. <laughs> but that was it. Robert, I was wondering, uh, going back a bit to the former choice, how you decided to, to put together, to merge these three uh, chapters of your film. Uh, to me, it was clear that while Judy section and the two kids section was still like, you know, uh, your mode, your language, cinematically, was, was there, no? This collaboration, co-creation with Rolando, Titus, and, and Judy. The, the part of the new Black Panthers feels more like, you know, observational, where as if you were taking a step back, as if you were kind of more surrendering to what they had to say. I would like to understand more this dynamic and how these things come together. I guess in this film in particular, uh, and that is a common a common trait for to, for to all the three stories or the three parts of the film. Actually, um, I led them. You know, they led me into the story. They are the narrators of their own stories, and uh, and that was a prerogative of mine since the beginning. Because if I were to go and do myself a service to tell a certain story um, of. Uh, uh, black people in America, uh, certainly, uh, I could only do it by just listening, and uh, and uh, and they, I let, I let go of control, and they led me into the stories. They they decided what uh, to film and when and how, uh, and even the level of proximity, with the exception of when the episode that Nat, Nat mentions that maybe it was too close, and that, but you know, Christian was fine with it. I discussed it with Christian, <laughs> but apart from that. Um, I think it's, I, I didn't take a step back. We could say that probably in the case, the Panthers, because as a, they stay a step, you know, for, you know, away from me, like a little further away. But uh, I don't even know if that, that is what, I, I'm not sure. I cannot even identify that exactly or pinpoint it. Yeah. All I know is that with the, uh, you know, the, um, I like Nat was saying it at dinner, you know, we just, you know, what we do, we 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 are very political. That you know, despite you know, humanly, we, you know, we are, and we were talking about having fun together. We had some moments of great fun, but you know, but the point is, we politicize. So that's the thing. It's like we, the film for them 
the purpose was that, to politicize it because it was necessary. And for Judy, it was also there, but it was also very indie, it was very cathartic. And for the kids, it was really um, nurturing because clearly that's a situation that's many, very common to a lot of black kids is not to have a dad in the family. Most likely uh, the dad is incarcerated, and that was the case in the, the, the story. It's 30% of black people, at least officially, official statistics, is at some point black men are incarcerated. 30% of them are. Hence the emergence of, of strong female figures. Uh, that is not my decision either. It's what I see every day. Uh, so in that sense, um, politicizing the panders, politicizing things, which was unnecessary, which is what the Black Panther, the New Black Panther Party does, and the Black Panthers did, and and uh, and that's what uh, creates not a distance, but perhaps a, um, what we can call distance is something, it's really this, the space that is needed to really speak with certain veh vehemently and, and strongly and to be heard. Because in the end, you know, everybody needed to be heard and I needed to just be the one who recorded that. And I think that was the necessary space. I think it's, uh, I didn't take any step back. I just couldn't, I just decided that that's, you know, I think that in the case of the Panthers, they probably stayed a little further away uh, with some exception. Judy, uh, I would like to hear more about, like, you know, your relationship with the community where, you know, you were living in with the bar and stuff, the bar that seemed to you way more than, I mean, just for living or work, but really, as we were saying before, when we introduced the round table, the, the side of forming a community. Can you tell us a bit more, like, you know, anecdotes? Of... I got the bar three, maybe three and a half years ago with the thought of being able to get the musicians that that's not working anymore, very great musicians in New Orleans that people don't even hire anymore. If you get a job on Bourbon Street as a black woman or a man, you get $25 for three hours. If it's me, you, Y'all two and me and him in a, in a band, and I'll present my bio. Hey, I'm Judy Hill. This is what I do. I sing. I'm an entertain. I dance. My dad is Jesse Hill. He made the song Oop Oop -a Doo. And I go to Bourbon Street with that. They'll immediately know I am an entertainer. Damn, what is black girl? She pretty good. She got a good background. We going to hire her ass, but we going to give her $150 for four hours because she's starving and she want to eat. She's trying to help a band and she ain't got no money, so we're going to put her up there like they used to do back in the days, in the slavery days. We don't want you unless you're working. You got to be digging up dirt or tap dancing to come into my house. We're going to keep it 100, you hear me? And I got the bar because of that, but if I go on Bourbon Street, that's what we're getting for three hours. But you go up there as a white boy, you're going to get $350 for three hours. So that keep us oppressing, depressing, permanent press or whatever kind of press you want to call it. It hurt us. We the baddest in the business. We know where we come from. My grandfather was a famous guitar player. My uncle played music for Fat Domino. He was Fat Domino's main guitar player. And I have a lot to stand behind me, but I ain't good enough because I'm a black bitch. So with that being said, I got the bar for people like us. The bar became very successful in three years. Not word of mouth, not computer, because I'm not good with all that Googling and I ain't that girl. But word of mouth. And I got white people that help me out with this. Don't get it messed up. I got some white friends that roll with me, just like some of these people in here. Regardless of their color, they came to support or whether they came to be nosy, they here. So that's how I built my bar, word of mouth. Or oh, they got a bar called Oopoopadoo. I had the bar three, first year and a half, 
I became number 15 best bars in New Orleans. Second year, I became number eight. The third year, I was number four best bars in the city of New Orleans. First time having a bar. First time having a bar. Just show you the magic. I ain't had nothing to do with. Yes. And I still was put out my bar behind paper. I was doing too good. Somebody ain't like that shit. And so let me get this bitch from around here. She doing too much. She done overcame Bourbon Street. And that's how I got put out my spot. But I, that's the reason I opened a bar for people like us. Just to, to give a, a, a bit of a background, maybe some of you were in the round table here alone, but we invited, like, you know, Nat, of course, but also more members of the new Black Panthers. And, um, and sadly, some of them were stopped and, and, and retained at the North American border in Canada, so they couldn't make it to, to London uh, for very ambiguous reasons uh, that possibly have to do with the political reasons. So this leads to the question that I want to ask you, Nat. What like you know radical activism right now means like you know in in the area where where you live in North America in general? Um, suicide. Hmm. <laughs> uh, no. Well, every country has had some kind of problem, cataclysm, and had their own heroes. You know, uh, Spartacus. Uh, you know, all 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 nations. You know. Vietnam, you know, Ho Chi Minh, you know, Cuba, Castro, Che Guevara, you know, all around the world, Italy, Mazzini, you know, uh, West Africa, you know, Kenya Bissau, uh, Amilcar Cabral, you know, all over the world, where we, where we want to look, e even here in some cases, you know, what happened to King George? You know, so uh, it, it's when you, when you were black and you talk about radical activism, it's like, it's next on the list for being labeled next to terrorism. But when you white and you radical activism, that's what you call freedom of speech. That's what you call the American, that's what makes this country so beautiful. You know, that's what makes this country so great. You know, black people being so, all the other groups have nationalism. There's no problem. Black people start yelling black power, black national, oh shit, that's racist. They wouldn't kill white people. You know, like, like I said, you know, it's simple. You know, so we understand what's going on, and we are the only ones that in America we're not bilingual. We're the only ones that are not bilingual. So when it comes to the other groups, it's all right to be, being, you know, looking out for your own. They got an Irish parade and all this kind of shit, whatever stuff like that. And I have no problem with this. It's cool. They get together and celebrate their culture on one specific day. That means something in it, right? So it's it's the same thing. But when it comes to us, it's some some alien thing. It's some thing that's just otherworldly, like you know that. Oh, it's radical. That's radical. That's controversial. If I say so, oh, he said something that's controversial. And these media goons, they make money off that stuff. You know, they controversy sells. They got people that just oh, just say something just for the hell of it, so they can stay relevant because their album is you know they mute, they broke, they they record careers is is almost over. So they'll say something stupid, you know, and and, and to, to, to stay relevant, right? So what I'm saying is, when it comes to us to be cool, you you give us integration. You know, if you talk to some of the elders that grew up in, in the South in the 50s and the 60s, they 70, 80, 90 years old, they tell you that was the worst damn mistake we ever made, integrating. Because we had black this, black that, all kind of stuff. You know, so it's nothing wrong with having your own shit. You know what I'm saying? And you, you still could be human with people. You know, black people, we beautiful people. We spiritual people everywhere we go. You know, we don't have to worry about attacking nobody, killing nobody, terrorizing nobody. We've been terrorized. You know, shit. I mean, look here in, in right here in Britain. You know, Britain claims, you know, they, oh, we freeing the slaves. Who oh, hooray? Who got reparated? The slave or the slave master? How many of y'all know y'all history? Who got reparated? The slave or the slave master? Who got reparated? The slave or the slave master? Huh? The slave master. Huh? Who wrote the check for him? Name. What's his, what's their name? What what that bank is over there? With that little split act like that? With that little statue that's right there? And that little city corporation? What what that bank called? Who wrote the check for him? Who wrote the check for him? Who wrote the check for the slave masters? You see? So see that what I'm saying? So it's like, when you say something that's radical active, no, it's not. It's the, it's the facts. And we start talking about reparation. Oh, here we go again. You know, they on that, you know, that was the past. We, we celebrate 4th of July with them every year and wave flags, you know? Ain't but two times black people, Americans in, in, in America. 
when they're running around the track at the Olympics and they're fighting in these proxy wars all over the world. Okay, so radical activism in America, that's like, it's got to be labeled something because they need to keep scaring people. So that's how they come up with this black identity extremist. So my comrades, they can't get a goddamn passport. She can't get a passport. We can't get through that because, oh, she's on a list. You know, like two of my, I was like, well, damn. Okay, uh, so you black identity extremist. And she goes, and, and, and the, the, the contradiction, she's a U.S. citizen. And they treated her like she was an alien from another planet at the consulate. That's supposed to be her constitutional right. You see what I'm saying? So we want to blow the lid off this shit, you know? You know, all the fiction that they feeding y'all, you know? This black on black crime, every time you see black people on the screen, they, you know, they in the news. But why you don't show the work we do? Why you don't show the good shit we do? You know what I'm saying? Well, we can't be accused of being racist because we got caught feeding white people on film. <laughs> so that's, that's just out. <laughs> You know, so they, they got to create something else. They got to make it. It's, it's labeling. They got to keep labeling us. They got to keep doing it. You know what I'm saying? So we tell the brothers on the street, look, man, y'all Panthers too. Y'all just unpoliticized Panther. I'm a politicized Panther. You an unpoliticized Panther. So it's my job to politicize you, get you to be like George Jackson instead of George Washington. <laughs> you see? So that's what it is. That's, you know, black. And, and we, we clear on these terms, activism. Oh, no, we revolutionaries. Activists do activist work. They got to start somewhere. You know, it's a stage. It's like, like they create, like, 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 what's his name? Uh, Ashcroft, whatever his name. He, he created that little blue, green, yellow, coal. You know, he's the one that created that shit, right? He scared people. Oh, coal red, right? Okay, so we say, you know, progressive, you know, uh, uh, activist, progressive, you know, radical, militant, and then revolutionary. So we had, we had cold up here now. So the rest, of everybody ain't got even here. You don't have no choice. What's that Brexit thing? You know, I've looked up with that. See, Trump see. See, when, when black people were saying this shit back in the 50s and 60s, the white people didn't want to hear it. Now they come up for them. Now they want to, oh, well, let's get together, man. We're going to be radicals and stuff. Y'all call yourself the White Panther part. And we're going to be radicals and shit. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's amazing, man. Thank you. Before, before moving on to, to you guys, I just want to ask you, Roberto, one last question. I would like to ideally bring on this stage also Ronaldo and Titus that I loved. Like, you know, their beauty, their grace for me was clashing with the brutality that, you know, he, they would experience like, you know, later on in life, maybe right now, I, I would like to hear like, you know, how did you, what was your relationship with them? And if you, if, if you are in contact with them and. Well, yeah, this is tough to talk about it right now because, uh, apart from Crystal and, and Sharif being, uh, held hostage in Toronto for no reason, I mean, no record, but that also Ronaldo got arrested, not detained, but arrested last week. And uh, for petty crime, crime that, uh, I don't know, probably people have committed here, I did, you know, stealing things, you know, at the age of 16, the things in store. But to be arrested, and the mother, they asked for help, asked for help, and she hasn't had a, the chance to talk to her, her son who's in jail. And, 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 and yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's just, it's just, I mean, it's just brutal. And the mother talking to us saying, you know, I, I, I nobody else to ask for help, really. I mean, who's going to, you know, nobody's listening. I can't even talk to my son. I mean, so, um, yes, I am in touch. <laughs> uh, and Titus is in pain. I mean, Titus was Titus Lerner, but this is what the film, I mean, it's, no, I take it back. It's not what the film is about. The film is just recording something that has been going on forever. And 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 it it and 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 just never fails to you know it, it, it never stop it never ends and that's what it is a cycle I mean the film it's just a snippet of a life and the two boys you know it's understand that part is understandable right these two boys the father's in jail perhaps you know they inherit inheriting a condition the socio political socio economical political uh, and and that's it and Ronaldo a wonderful boy. Uh, and now he's in jail, he's incarcerated. So the little brother, and that's what they were talking about in the film. So that's a story that is not a story of white people, at least not, not, not something I never th thought of it. I mean, I don't, it's not my story. It will never be, not the story of my children, although they're mixed race, but I don't think it will ever be the story. Uh, um, so yes, I am in touch with them. Uh, I mean, they but they, that's what they that's represent. Okay. I mean, they represent themselves and what does that mean for these two black children, we represent uh, the continuation of a, of, of some of the perpetuation of, of a condition. 
and uh, that makes sure, which is not a condition, which is not malaise, is this institutionalized racism. That's how we, we call it, which means for which, you know, the preservation of the species, the supremacy of one race needs to be preserved by eliminating the other race. And, and that's how it is. So it never fit. This system never fails. It's a perfect machine. It's a perfect machine. And so now and around is in jail. I'm in touch with in jail. I'm here. And it's just, just simply, I don't know how to describe it. Emotionally, it's just, it's just brutal. Is there any questions from you guys? There's a mic coming. To, uh, we'll start to, yeah, we'll start with the gentleman, then we will move here. Yes. Hi. Thank you for that. Um, I just want to talk about um, your performance, Judy, Judith. Judy. Judy, I beg your pardon. Um, I, I found that probably the most intense performance I've seen for, for a long time, and I watch a lot of films. Um, there was just something amazingly, I'm, as I can see, honest, and, and, and also just, yeah, it just had me up and down in all sorts of places. And I wanted to know how this relationship works between a director and yourself when the material is so personal. And I'm trying to understand as somebody who also stands behind the camera myself, how does that happen? How, how does something so magical get captured in this? And how do you represent that? Me and myself, I would call it a blessing. As I was saying earlier, I had been needed to tell that story, but never knew I was going to be on the big screen with it. But I needed somebody to hear me. I have a huge family. I have a lot of people from the neighborhood, but I never got comfortable enough. Maybe it's, nobody never had time to hear. But in a process of all of us coming together, the Panthers way over there, Titus and him over there, I'm over here, but the stories met up. You know, everybody was on their own time. And, and, and I think, like I always say, I thank God for Mr. Minavini. You know, I needed to tell that story. And in a process of him with them cameras on, it just happened to come out. And um, only because I was comfortable enough with him and I was comfortable enough to finally hear a woman say she went through that. I'm like, all right, let's run it. Shit, I've been through that. Let me tell you this, and this happening. Just out the blue, but, but, but it was hard. It, it hurt it to get it out, but it cleans me. Now my back and my neck don't hurt no more. I can see, I can feel now. But before then, three, two years ago, I was numb. I hated men. I ain't like guys. Then I do like them one minute. Next minute, I won't choke them because they're speaking to me. I'm like, yeah, his ass won't. Yeah. But, and, and yeah, it was, it was real, real deep. And, and when I watch it for the first time in Venice, I couldn't breathe because I never seen it before then. I thought it was going to be a little CD. I told Roberto, I say, hey, whatever you do with it, send me the CD, not knowing it's going to get halfway around the world. But it was deep, though, you know. It was deep. I saw something in me I didn't know was there. I really, really did. I screamed. I didn't cry. I screamed in the process. But I'm free now. I can breathe now. question I was going to ask was similar around kinship and um, intimacy um, and the connection with healing and uh, spirituality um, seems to be the underlying uh, um, thread through the film but I don't is that a resistance to the machine that you were talking about is that a story that we can't all relate to I don't understand mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's, well, it's as if, I, like, I know the particulars of the story is different in, in different places, but is sent, the, the essential element of our stories around how we live through fragmentation and, and yeah. Um, it's a story. Yeah, we can all relate. I'm not. I mean, I guess yes and no. I don't know. Well, like all I can share is that that's for me the importance. And and, and Nico asked that before, like you know, putting those three stories. That's the importance of 
working at different levels. And that's also the importance of, of working with the Black Panthers because uh, uh, of not wanting to present something that is uh, uh, towards which people can immediately relate at the first level, which is emotional reaction. Uh, uh, the combining, paral making parallelisms between, you know, among kids and Panthers, and, and that throws that easy connection, which is a first level reaction, that emotional connection, off a little bit. Because if we, I think, if we, and I, talk, I speak for myself, and this is a process of, like, that is experiential, it's a learning process that I go through, and I'm, that I went through, and I'm going through. So uh, uh, it's kind of this, this kind of um, dialectics among all of them. So we, at the moment where we empathize with a woman and her suffering, are we able to empathize with a woman who's a leader of the Black Panthers and, and her suffering that are expressed in a different way uh, as we suffer for a child uh, that, are, you know, his father's in jail? Um, and if the counterpoint immediately after, well, then we see a, a Michael, a man who actually is in and out of jail and currently in jail and on drugs, can we actually be non-discriminatory, do you say that, and, and empathize with all of them, I mean, I don't know. Can we empathize with the panthers when they raise their voice? Only when they feed. I've heard feedback like that. Ah, the placement of the panther scene when they feed should probably come much earlier so that you understand, you know, so you're prepared to see the rest because you already understand that they, they do something good. I'm like, well, this is not. So this is a language that they don't want to use. And I don't even know if I'm replying, responding to that question. But, you know, the to relate to a story is a double-edged sword um, because the fundamental issue for me personally is that I don't relate at all because I am white. So I never went through anything that people go through in the movie. Um, Kingdoms. Well, yeah, well, that's a human aspect of it, of course. The hum from a human standpoint, but I think the film in a way, transcends that. I mean, there is the intimacy, but there also transcendence of that because it's also about, it, it has very little to do about, you know, it says let, it doesn't have a lot to do with me and the intimacy with them, which is something that is personal, but this ultimately is a film about some people who have a voice. And, and that, that was really the ultimate goal. And uh, relatability is an issue. It's something that has to do with uh, several several things. Uh, as I said, for me, it's important that there's different, you know, empathy, which is a cultural. Right? So, I mean, even even intimacy is cultural. It's not it's not biological. Uh, intimacy is defined as a safe space where people can express themselves uh, without fear of being rejected. Uh, so um, since it's all of that is cultural. I challenge my own sense of empathy by, you know, placing kids and panthers and women with different languages, different experiences. So, yeah, let's go a bit at the back now, so that we can all the way there. Yes, that gentleman away the down. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a great film, uh, Judy. Thank you for being unapolog unapologetically yourself in the film. Uh, was very much appreciated. Uh, before I say my question, I'd just like to speak some truth, if that's okay. Um, first of all, just the notion that, you know, there's this absenteeism with uh, black fathers or, or whatnot, that's not necessarily the case, you know. Uh, it doesn't need, that's not a stereotype that necessarily should be perpetuated, uh, perhaps reconsidered rather, uh, because there are a lot of people that are trying to be active in the uh, family's life. So, you know, uh, on that front. The other is kind of the term black on black violence. Like that's a relationship that needs to be reconsidered. Is there really a relationship between race and crime? You know, um, because there've been similar kind of relationships that were trying to be drawn in the past. For example, between race and intelligence, which uh, was one of the uh, ways in which slavery was justified, right? So we need to be very careful in the way that we actually even entertain questions in the first place. You know, should we even be answering questions about black on black violence? Because <laughs> is it a question that 
even uh, requires an answer, you know? So uh, that, that, that's what I kind of had to say on, on that front. But just curious as to some of the, uh, some of the people in the, the film, would they be uh, what their lives looking now after the film, you know? Uh, are they being remunerated in any way or is there kind of some, some kind of uh, provision for them or, you know, what's their life looking now after the film? Thank you. The young lady, sorry, let's go close. The young lady that I was speaking to, she's still drowning in her own tears. She been drowning for a long time. And it don't mean because she's on the screen that she's been saved. Some people can't be saved. Some people are so twisted and messed up. They lay in that, that, that mess because it's comfortable there. And, and she's fine with it. I know for a fact she wish she can do better. But it's a lot of odds against her. So she good with that. Sad to say. Michael, my cousin, he's in the penitentiary right now for kicking somebody ass again. That's what he do, he like to fight because he been abused. He's good with that. He, this ain't his first rodeo. My mom, her house is up for sale. She got to move in two weeks. My brother, Eric, he walking up and down the street, still on drugs. I, I know he wish he can do better, but I was I, I'm trying to explain about the comfort. Some people comf comfortable in their own situation. And it's sad to be there, but you've been doomed when you was born. Some, some people go with that, baby. Now, for as me, I met me a man, as I was speaking about. He got a couple of houses, and he's good to me. But we having a sexual problem. He won't kids. I would never be able to bear him a kid. I was fucked up by my brother-in-law hate that shit. I wanted two kids too. Shit. But I'm doing okay. I got me a little nice little cute car that he bought me. But I'm still not happy because I hate for him to ask for sex and stuff. I don't know when I'll be ready. Alcohol don't even help. And, 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 and Titus, Roberto just told you Titus is the baby. He's in school still. His brother went to jail for stealing some goddamn shoes. A little pet tennis, you know. That back in the days, you wouldn't go to jail for that. But black people are being, I think we still, we, we, we about to hit back to where we come from with that, with that racism. It's getting really, really, really bad again. And, and, and well, I just wanted to tell you what we're doing today, honey. Thanks for asking. I want to comment on something you said about black on black crime. We under, as revolutionaries, we understand that black on black crime is a political tool to, to thwart social change, you know, in a capitalist society. Black on black crime is 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 a commodity, you know, on Wall Street. Stocks and bonds shares, whack and huck corrections corporation of America to have their shares, their stocks, their bonds. I was in a meeting, you know, in a law in a law clinic at, at a university in New Orleans. And I never forget this. He's the only white dude in the room. And he was talking about, well, yeah, I got this buddy of mine work down there, you know, at the courthouse, which we call, which what we call the auction block, okay, where they trot you in the court and all that kind of shit, right? And then the, the, the concentration camp is like right next door to that, right, the gulag. So he said, well, I, I was calling my buddy, you know, you know, you know, everybody coming back trying to readjust to Hurricane America that y'all know as Hurricane Katrina. And he was like, well, I had a buddy of mine, so I called him, well, hey, man, how's everything going over there? He said, it's a fucking disaster over here. He said, what do you mean they're not building, they're not rebuilding? He said, no, the prison ain't filled up. See? So that's why the FBI keeps statistics on crime in so-called urban communities. But they don't keep statistics on crime in suburban communities. So they know that their brothers out there who done figured their game out, who done mapped their system out, now go out there and politicize the youth. Right? That's what the Cointel Pro operation was about, to prevent the rise of a black messiah amongst the masses of the people, especially among the youth. So crime is a political tool to interrupt or dislodge possible social revolution in a capitalist society. That's what black on black crime is. 
Now you watch TV, you see all that shit. And they beam it over here. I'm quite sure they beam it over here. Show black people this or whatever. Oh, uh, oh, Detroit. The, notice, notice how they always swapping cities around. The shit is the number one capital in the world. One minute it's Washington D.C., then it's Detroit, then it's New Orleans, then the South Central. Just think about that shit. So you mean there's no other murder capitals around the rest of the world in this little tiny country? So big as earth is, uh, America got all the, the the murder. That's murder. It's amazing how they do it because capitalism thrives off what? Profit motive. They teach you that in school. When you take free enterprise class, what they do? They teach you that in school. That's their religion. You know, it's like their Bible. So they, they, if crime went down, the capitalists would panic. Wall Street would panic because they need crime. That's why the dope trade maintains itself. It perpetuates itself. You mean to tell me you got all this technology, you gonna tell me you, you, you searching the mountains for, for, for one dude you looking in the mouth for one nigga who y'all claim bombed some bills and all this little shit. You blew up this and that, whatever the ship. So y'all looking for one dude and y'all got a bunker buster. You're going to blow up this mine. He's in a, you can find him with all this technology. And the damn poppy fields is right there wide open. Where you can see it from the sky on a satellite. You know, you can see the poppy plant, the coca leaves right there in South America. And they're talking about ending the, the war on drugs. Hell, drop the 500 pound bomb on the, on the damn, on the field. We know where it's going. You wipe it out overnight, but they can't do that. When 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 that when that crash hit that they call a recession, you know, they, again, man, y'all gotta really understand how this shit work. You really have to understand how it work. You know what I'm saying? They studied Aristotle. You gotta understand how it works. So when that when that crash hit, what did they do? They get to do off off the record. He said, look, he was trying to interview him. He said, not on not on record. He said, I, if, if this is all right, I'll tell you. So they asked him. Then the dude for the UN who, who, who oversees this stuff, you know, about drug, you know, international drug, he said it. He, he asked him, what saved America's economy? The dope money. The dope money saved them. We, the, the, it, look, it's no different than soybean on the market, Chiquilla Banana Company, which has always been a front for the CIA to, to transport drugs, right? So, you know, commodities. That's why marijuana is legal. They've been trying to figure this shit out. Like, like the Prohibition era. When they had the liquor, they were bootlegging. Right? So they said, well, look, it's illegal because of what? We not getting our cut. So that shit's illegal. So they start getting their cut. The shit's legal. So we's not, it's been illegal because they were trying to figure, okay, how are we going to get our cut? In the meantime, all these young black dudes is going to prison. Right? So they said, okay, we, we got what we want. Oh, it's legal. Oh, shit, look, it, 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 heal, it heals arthritis, cataracts, you know. Oh, it's legal. It's a hustle. That's what capitalism is. They don't care about none of this shit. They don't, they don't, you know what I'm saying? They don't believe in none of this. Profit motive, that's all that matters to them. We're all commodities. That's what I'm telling you. That's how it works. So black on black crime is part of the process. That's how they operate. Hong Kong, Shanghai Bank, Bank of England, all of them. Deutsche Bank. They're all on the dope money. You got this shit called dark money, offshore bank accounts. What is that? Let us get some offshore bank accounts and some dark money. How you have a they how you how you get hired as somebody to, to manage all these thousands of bank accounts? Hey, you, they ask, well, what's the name of that? I don't know. You don't know the name of your the, the people that you manage their money. Who would do that? Who would do that? How, who would let you manage their shit and you, you don't know they don't know your name? That's how it works. That's what capitalism is about. The reason why they're afraid of socialism is because you know why? If Donald Trump pulled up trying to get in the club and y'all been standing out there in line for two hours trying to get in the spot, Donald Trump pulls and he goes right in. But in the socialist society, his ass got to get in the line like everybody else. If you go, if you go to the grocery line and shit, you know, hur oh, hurricane coming, everybody start rushing to the store, start stacking up on water. The line is all the way to the back of the store. Donald Trump walks in, oh, oh, he goes in and takes shit and leave out. No, and the socialist society, Get in the line like everybody else. That's, how, that's why they're afraid of socialism, because they won't be able to lord it over everybody. Look what they're doing in Venezuela. Maduro was elected democratically. They told you we live in a democrat. Do y'all believe in y'all in, here, here in London, here in Britain? Do y'all believe y'all live in a democratic society? Okay, you see, how, you, you see, that's what I'm saying to you. So it's a farce. But they got to keep pushing it to you because they need slaves. You cannot be a billionaire without screwing somebody over. That's what Wall Street. Why is it called Wall Street? Why? Is the, you, you, you see a wall out there? That's how, that's how this shit works. And this shit was built off the back 
of black people, African people, who were transported all over the world. They went to North, what they call, what they fictitiously call North America, which I'm supposed to be a citizen of. My comrade's supposed to be a citizen of, but she couldn't get a passport. So what law did she break? You tell me under the Constitution, what law did she break? Nothing. She didn't break no law. We got political prisoners in prison that this country does not want to recognize, but they charging Russia with the gulags, Korea, uh, 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 Cambodia, you know, Pol Pot. Oh, human rights violation. Murdered the shit out of Pol Sudan. Murdered Gaddafi, Slobodan, Milosevic, the whole shit. And everything that they say they did, George Bush did it. Henry, Henry Kissinger pulled off the whole Chile thing in 73. Had people murdered. To this day, people still wonder where their loved ones at. So, you know, it's, it's serious, man. You, tell you, you falling for this shit. It's bullshit. Oh, capitalism is evil. Uh, man, look, socialism is evil. But look at what they're doing to Venezuela. That man was elected by six billion people who voted. And then this fool gets on here, propaganda. Oh, well, see the ballot box. They don't have a ballot box, idiot. They're using the machines. You see, that's how it works. But that's what black on blind, black on black crime is a part of that. And they cannot maintain this shit. They cannot keep black people under control if they do not have black on black crime. Because it gives the pigs the excuse to brutalize us. Probable cause. It gives them the excuse. Philando Castile was murdered in front of his bo in front of his daughter, his wife, his wife, literally filming this shit. He told his pig. You know, I'm a licensed guy. I have a weapon. You know, I'm reaching for my pop thing. Who does that? You have to understand the role of the police. The police is a military arm to protect the property class. That's why you get your ass beat. That's why brothers get murdered in America. And they get off because the pigs would rebel if they would start convicting them as guilty. They rebel. When Beyonce did that little shit at the Super Bowl, what did the police do? Oh, she's her concert is where? Where was that at? What did the police they got together and say they they protested? Well, we're not gonna we're not gonna secure this shit tonight. Get your own security. Okay, well, bitch, I'm rich. That's how it works, though. You gotta wake up. Stop y'all living it. You got you gotta stop letting them make you live in a bubble. Fiction. Black identity extremists, they cannot prove one case. The only cases that they can prove under terror, the, 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 the terrorist law is the white guys who murdered police officers who were planning bombings. And they didn't convict none of them under the terrorist act. They said that was just some violence and shit. Look at, look at uh, in, what that, New Zealand, I think, where the guy went up into the mosque. and he just, Y'all saw that video? Did you see what he did? He went up in there calmly as I don't know what. Walked up in there. Bang, 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 bang. Started outside, right? Patiently, calmly, walked out, went into the alley, dropped that air on the ground, picked up the other one, click, clack, put the shit in, walked back in, and went in, and he was shooting dead bodies all over again. How long did that last? Where was the police in 17 goddamn minutes? Man, got to wake up. Or, or it'll be the end. Your ship's sinking. Thank you. Before coming to a close, Robert, I just wanted to touch on a point that you know we've been talking in the past a lot, and for me it's also very important. The fact that you know you were talking about empathy before, no, about uh, feelings, about uh, the process of something, or being with people, being with these people. Um, for me, here is where it comes the cultural appropriation. No, why we need to use categories related to gender, race, sexuality, religion to allow people to feel, to represent, to engage, to create a community. Now, I would like to hear from you how this affected, like you know, your project, and maybe also the relationship that you uh, encountered along the way. Yeah, I guess that's what I was trying to say about um, um, the fact that I, um, the importance of not um, emphasizing that aspect, I mean, the relation, the empathetic relationship within the filmmaker and the characters, it was not. So, and therefore this safe space based on which we can create intimacy, that was not um, uh, the focus of it. The focus was to be at service, offer 
a platform uh, uh, offer some that is in my power, which is the media mediatic power, to then you know uh, uh, get a you know mm, their own experiences and the messages inherent to it uh, in, uh, out. So uh, I agree with you in that sense. The the uh, intimacy and empathy were not uh, the focus of the film, and that's why uh, I worked at different levels. And uh, uh, and on all those levels, there was there was uh, uh, relationships, sometimes symbiotic, sometimes based on trust and based on uh, uh, trust that is an ongoing process as it goes back and forth, and it's not something that uh, a goal to be reached. It is something to be nurtured. And it goes, and it swings, um, and that's really what it what it was. I mean, it, it, this time, uh, unlike other projects that I made, the goal was really to, to, uh, to depict something that was that was existing and to be led into the stories. And I did that with uh, that. I was I was aware of all that since the beginning. Of course, like, you know, we will continue all night. There is a party that already started. You all got your tokens. This film quickly sold out, but the ICA, we are releasing, distributing theatrically in UK and Ireland at the end of June. So if you like it, love it, please spread the love. And please join me in welcoming Roberto Mirvini, Judy Hill, and Nat Turner.